So, good morning. Uh, today we are talking about dynamic experiments. So now we are going to put together what we have learned until now and use it uh, for um, a specific type of experiments, which is quite frequently occurring. And um, some of the relevant inf um, books are, for example, this uh, book by Gostabi. Image registration principles gives a very nice overview of registration techniques. Uh, I will come to what registration is later. And then there is also the book by uh, Bernd Jene, uh, Spatial Temporal um, Image Processing. Gives uh, also some background on how to work with images and time series of images in particular. Then there is um, a whole bunch of um, papers and sites to take a look at. And uh, well, just if you're interested, please go in here and check different things. Um, yeah, there is, for example, also for, uh, this um, open CV uh, tutorials, which I think is probably misspelled. I don't know, but it looks like it's misspelled down there. Um, yeah, until now we have been talking about the images themselves. Uh, we have uh, done some image enhancement, highlighting uh, different uh, features in the images, trying to minimize the noise, understanding what the histogram tells us, trying to automatize the whole procedure, doing component labeling, shape analysis, looking at more complicated shapes and looking at distribution of um, shape features uh, from these. And um, now we are going more into what's giving us the big. So we had already done already the um, different analysis techniques, but now with the dynamic experiments, we come into the problems of volume, because if you start doing tomographies in time series, you soon, very soon end up in terabytes of data and possibly even more. And then we have the velocity problem. And um, in particular, now you get into really great volumes if you want variety in your samples. So say you want some kind of uh, load cycle of um, something, say a mechanical construction or a piece of bone or something like that. And you want to see different, uh, di um, different uh, categories or different treatments of these um, samples then you end up in even more data. <coughs> and of course, to make this possible, our analysis code should be scalable and ideally also fast. Um, fast is a thing where you can actually fall into a trap. You get too, too um, interesting in making things fast and forget what you should do. So maybe think about that first. But if you have terabytes of data, time is actually an issue if you want to run through your data. And uh, one thing is trying to reduce your um, data into more digestible uh, components uh, very soon. So instead of having terabytes, you may only work with some megabytes and that makes it easier to work with in the long run. Um, yeah. In principle, a little bit of motivation and scientific goals of these uh, experiments. And um, in some cases, actually makes sense to do some tuning using uh, simulations in order to be able to do experiment design. And that's also a topic that I will come up with. So we have some dynamic experiments. First of all, we have um, the problem of relating objects in motion in some sense. Could be cells moving around, could be um, rigid components that are moving or uh, under load. And um, the important thing here is that uh, there is a continuous change in the sample and um, or something is at least uh, moving in some sense. We have also the real-time issue. When you do the experiment, you have to make sure that the experiment is happening in the pace of time that you need. And um, there is, oh, 
That is almost too small. Let's see if I can. Yeah, that's better. So, um, so the real time is that things are actually happening and you can't stop it. And uh, in computing, when you're talking about real time systems, is that one thing data is usually processed within milliseconds, but the important thing is that you deliver the results within a given time. So the given time would be the sampling rate of the system or of the acquisi uh, uh, acquisition rate should meet the speed of the process. And with imaging, we have the whole um, capture, storage, uh, manipulation, display. That can actually be done offline mostly, but if you really produce a lot of data, then you should maybe consider doing some processing even on the fly, and then you need, again, the real-time aspects of the systems. So, um, for example, on synchrotron beamlines, they do tomographic reconstruction in the rate that the data is produced, because it produces so much data that you can't really handle the raw data and store it, and then uh, in an efficient way uh, process it afterwards. It would give you a, a huge um, uh, bow, uh, what's it called, uh, front wave uh, that you need to um, to process afterwards. So it's actually most convenient to process on on the fly. With experiments, we have two types of dynamic experiments. One is continuous, so you initiate it and it runs somehow, and um, you have no way to really. Yeah, well, you can control it by control parameters, but it's a continuous flow that ends at some point. The other one is that you can have repeti uh, repetitive uh, experiments where the thing is cyclic, coming back to the same point again. And that's something you can use in the acquisition. For example, if you make uh, images of an, of an engine, the engine is always coming back because it's a rotating system. And with that, you can also in uh, do accumulative uh, acquisition in order to improve the signal to noise ratio because um, when you rotate you may rotate at a um, what was it 8000 rpm and uh, that's yes 8000 rpm um, that would be for example a two stroke engine and um, that is way too short to really get the angle of um, all positions of, of, um, of the axis. So instead, you just have a trigger point, and then you do a lot of images at that point. Next trigger point, you do a lot of images at that point, and so on. So that is also a way of capturing uh, these uh, repetitive uh, experiments. So what information would you like to see within these uh, experiments? So of course, see how fast something is moving. Maybe it can be a colony of some bacteria. How fast is this um, um, bacteria colony growing? Could also be that they are moving around for some reason. Uh, could be that uh, with eating, uh, getting more nutrition, they may grow, and maybe even they mo may move faster, depending on the treatment, and also how they are rearranging. Sometimes they are also doing um, um, separation so they can split up in more particles. So there are a lot of things, questions you can ask about when you look at um, a dynamic experiment. So with image analysis, then we have some new questions to ask. How can we track the objects between two points? So if the object, you have an object, and you want to know how much it moved. You could also want to track the shape. That is quite easy in a way, but it always falls back to um, you have to identify the items between different frames. And um, coming on, uh, track topology, tracking voxels, and um, we could also look at the strain and deformation in the objects. That's a little bit different one that I'm going to show you in the end. And there could also be some more general cases of what you want to look at. But a very important thing is how to track the items from frame to frame. 
because you have sampled frames and uh, things may move or should move most likely and you want to move them around so looking at this example this is um, some foam and you can see that it's um, it's bubbling up and um, now we, we want to see in these 3d images we want to see maybe how the bubbles are moving maybe how they change the size uh, maybe how um, if they are popping together or something like that but looking at the movie like this it's not so easy to analyze so we need some tool to get one step further in the analysis and actually if you could only look at it it would still be only the qualitative information and the problem is also getting an idea of what's happening here you have such clutter of um, the bubble walls that you don't see what's happening some some levels in and the 2d screen can only show you 2d and that's the limitation here there are different ways of visualize this so maybe you could do something better but um, usually you're stuck at this qualitative information so now we want to do some more uh, better analysis it can also be that 2d movies can be challenging you have for example here a water jet with some bubbles and um, you see some bubbles flying b uh, by uh, very rapidly and um, you want to know how what the shape is and um, also where they are located and um, thanks to the low signal to noise ratio here it's not very easy to uh, detect where you have these um, another time series, a 2D time series, is uh, coffee making. That's actually a more fun experiment I did. You can see how how water is boiling uh, and um, going through the coffee. Uh, I, I uploaded that as a YouTube movie. That was more fun demonstration ex experiment, but you can still see here in ways how you can visualize it. So you have the starting point here and um, the end point here and if you take an image in the plane of time instead so normally we look at x and y uh, if we look at the y y and t image you can see that um, the water is decreasing in this side and the water is increasing in that side so this is a way how you can look at the uh, image information in in these um, uh, movies Another f kind of uh, series is um, projection series that you can produce into um, uh, afterwards reconstruct into tomography data. And uh, what you get is actually a series like this where you have the gantry is going around the patient and you can see how it's moving. You can see some um, uh, of the organs here. And uh, with the help of CT reconstruction algorithms, you can reconstruct the 3D volume. But still, you can do already some analysis on this level, so that can also be relevant. Another case is uh, we have here um, a tilt series from um, electron uh, microscopy. That's quite typical to, to get some depth information that they tilt, tilt the sample a little bit. They can't tilt it fully because then you would probably crash the, um, the apparatus, but uh, you can tilt it and then you can get some depth information from that and that's also yet another kind of series and um, that uh, could be analyzed and here the the problem is actually you can see that it's moving around so what they need to do is to do a jitter correction that the sample is nicely aligned through the rotation series and that is a little bit of the artwork with the um, tilt series um, reconstruction and analysis and uh, goals could be rheology, looking at uh, how uh, fluids are moving around in different systems, could be blood movement in, um, in the different blood vessels, could be oil going through um, porous rock, or maybe even the airflow through bread when you're baking it. What we also would like to see is maybe a deformation and uh, there again, we can look at uh, different biological sample, but it could also be that you have um, 
by different treatment, uh, looking into, for example, wood, that would be a civil, civil engineering application, see how, how different treatments um, change uh, the properties of the ma material. And um, in dynamic experiments, the first step is actually to plan the experiment itself. And um, we have quite many limitations. The first one is we may have limited field of view. That would mean that the sample possibly goes outside of the field of view and comes back again. And that is something you need to, to plan for. The voxel size, of course, if um, you don't, um, can't resolve, then of course you can't uh, see what you want. And uh, the frame rate of the measurements is also a relevant thing. How fast can your detector acquire the images? Then comes uh, physical interaction is um, the dose limitation. As you have seen before, the signal to noise ratio depends on the, uh, the dose you uh, acquire the images with. But, uh, and you want to, of course, increase the dose to a level that you can see what you want. But on the other hand, that can be damaging the sample. So um, you may not be able to uh, do it at the, the dose you want. Or else it can also be that the source can't produce more flux. So then you're also stuck on that. And um, well, there's always some kind of cost of, uh, of each measurement. May it be that it's beam time, it's um, sample damage, uh, cost of the sample, etc. And um, always the balance is between what kind of magnification you want and what time scale you want to measure. And um, the qual image quality can be affected by different things. The uh, process speed, how fast is the process um, moving along, and uh, the spatial resolution, and also intensity dynamics in the sample. So um, if we have um, a dose-limited ex experiment, let's see if I can, no, I can't move up. Oh, that is blocked here. Okay, then we don't see that table at the end. Um, that's a pity. Let's see, maybe I should... No, let, let's just talk. Um, so we have an example. We have 100 micron pixels. We have one uh, second exposure time and we have, say, 800 neutrons per pixel. And um, if we want to maintain the signal-to-noise ratio and want smaller pixels, then we would need to uh, increase the exposure time and uh, because we can't increase the number of neutrons per pixel. If we want a higher frame rate and still keep the signal-to-noise ratio, of course, we have to increase the pixel size. So you always have to balance between these two uh, to get the quality image quality that you want. Or else you have to decide, okay, I can live with a lower signal-to-noise ratio, then you can push both. Another option would be to go to a, a different source and uh, get maybe a factor of five more neutrons. Then you have to apply for that kind of beam time. But I say neutrons here, but it also applies to light, to x-rays, whatever emission you're using. Most sources are limited to some point. So if you have a lab-based source with maybe uh, 150 watts, you cannot get the same image quality in time series as you would get at a synchrotron experiment. On the other hand, with the lab-based source, you can maybe have a larger field of view than you can have with the synchrotron. So again, there is also a balance of um, what you can do and see. What you can do to get the smaller, pic uh, larger pixels is to do rebinning, but um, of course that is at the cost. You can see here that um, in this part of the image I have very fine pixels and then in order to get a better signal to noise ratio I did some binning and then you can see that the pixels are much much coarser and uh, you may then miss out uh, fine spatial details. So you have to really make the decision what you really want to see. And uh, for the frame rate there are different frame rates we can use uh, in order to follow the, the, um, the changes in the process. 
And ideally, you should have something like 10 to 20 points on the step. When you change uh, a parameter, you see a step, you should have 10 to 20 points to get a really good, smooth uh, following of the behavior. A bad sampling would be that you do measurements and then you actually miss what's happening just in this uh, uh, transient phase and you don't see anything at all. So that is to be avoided. Maybe with some luck you could possibly tune it so you get one point in the middle, but still you would like to have several points more. One approach is if you can go to piecewise constant that you drive the system to a intermediate steady state, do your imaging, and then you move it to the next step, do your imaging, next step, do your imaging. And uh, for some experiments, that is already good to get your, your series. But for other experiments, you really want to see uh, what's actually happening during the, the change from step one to step two. And uh, when you plan the experiment, you can more or less look at this uh, pir uh, pyramid here, where you can uh, select, say, if you want to go for feature size or resolution, you need smaller pixels. If you want to increase the signal to noise ratio, you have to either increase um, the pixel size or the um, uh, exposure time. And if you want higher frame rate to increase the frames per second, then it will cost you something and then you will land somewhere around in this triangle depending on where you are. And uh, usually you are always under constraint that you have a limited flux from your source. So you, you, the balance, it's uh, always a balancing game to, to get the right thing. Maybe you know a fantastic denoising algorithm and then you can live with lower signal to noise ratio, then that's a fine. Um, yeah, so you, you have always some cost if you pull in one direction in this triangle. Uh, simple processes you can actually analyze in the way that I mentioned already in, um, in the, um, let's see, make it a bit larger. So, um, with a coffee pot. So if you have a movie like this, you can of course watch it as a movie, but then you can only get the qualitative information out of it. And uh, what I do quite in quite many experiments is that I, I extract YT or XT frames or images. So we have each frame here stacked up and then I create an image in this direction. So you actually look at movie as a three-dimensional image and uh, instead of just see a dot that's bouncing up and down you can actually see in this image can see what is actually happening and uh, that now I need to go back in the scaling uh, is done in um, several um, experiments Right now, my colleagues at the Soil Physics, they do a lot of capillary rise experiments where you put a sample in a basin and see how the waterfront is rising up. And uh, maybe it doesn't look so exciting when looking at it, but you can learn a lot about the sample behavior from it. And if I extract a YT frame from that, you can see that there is some kind of trend in it and this trend actually is proportional to the square root of time and uh, by some um, edge detection it's possible to extract the uh, these points of the front and we can nicely fit them to um, a square root of t uh, relation and from that you can learn about wetting angles within the medium for example, and if you want to look more in detail how that works, uh, I even made a special tutorial where you can uh, try and test your own data. Or test with the data I provided, or your own, of course, if you do it. And uh, one fun experiment you can do is when you dunk a cookie in your coffee, you can see how the water or the coffee front is moving up. That can be described by that equation. And um, 
sometimes it's or well always a experiment costs something to do and uh, it may be too expensive to uh, waste two days on just learning what parameters you want to have uh, you don't maybe maybe even get access to the equipment and one way is to tune then your experiment with the help of simulations and um, then you can better get a grasp of which uh, parameters you need in order to get the um, quality and uh, able to capture the um, the process that you want and the other one uh, other reason for doing the simulations is to get more data for for example training of uh, machine learning algorithms etc because um, the main data is so hard to get by that you don't get sufficient for the training So, what we want to do, uh, let's say we want to track some uh, cell images and uh, we have already got rid of uh, all the noise and analyzed the shape, etc. And uh, now we want to get some meaningful information out of these, um, in particular from a time series of these uh, cells moving around. So, how can we do it? There are different ways to look at uh, where we have the images and um, we can look at a lot of pixel voxel based methods uh, where we have cross correlation, dig digital image correlation and uh, adding some physics, uh, doing affine transformation, non-rigid transformations on the data and um, sometimes you can also use something called key points which I come to and um, problems that we want to look at is maybe some thickness information, curvature, two-point correlation, etc. to to learn more about um, our sample. And uh, let's start with a basic simulation and uh, we want to look at just a number of dots in this plot and we want to introduce some movement in this. The first part is we create this movie of uh, moving, call it cells. And we can see that they are moving uh, minus one, minus one, I think it is, yeah. Or is it one is minus and one is plus, yeah. Whatever, we, we can see uh, from the vectors afterwards. But this is the, the data we want to analyze. And um, first step is we create our um, images, so we need to do some thresholding, we need to label each object, possibly doing some shape analysis to really identify them, and then afterwards we want to do uh, distribution analysis. And um, here I did all that in this piece of code, so we have the, the labeling of the threshold image, getting the region properties, getting label, x, y, and area and that is put into a data frame. So this is just our um, container for, for the information. And with this, we have already reduced our data from being a set of images into a table, which is just a few lines and uh, much easier to handle. No? Hello. Hm. Doesn't want to move on. There he comes. So if we look at all the positions that we have found in all the data frames, we can see, okay, we have frame one are the blue ones, then we have frame two, three, four, and um, these are the, the dots that we want to somehow connect and relate to each other. And uh, that is to describe the motion minus one, minus one, Ah, okay, the coordinate system doesn't tell the right thing. That's why I'm confused. But anyway, in, in the end, we want to describe that we have this motion. And the question is how we can do it. And um, we have to do some kind of scoring, tracking. So now we have to go from frame to frame and see which one is the most probable. And um, that can be done in different ways. So starting out with the sim most simple one, that would be a nearest neighbor approach. So having one dot in frame one 
and looking at the closest one in the next frame. And that could be our possible network. But um, this is only works in very simple cases. I like this one. And um, here we look at uh, just the probability that we have point 0.1 and point 0.2, looking at the, the minimal distance between them. And uh, here we get the different distances. You can see that this point has distances to all the other ones. And uh, here it's actually a bit ambiguous because you have this point has the same distance to that point as to that point. And this one, same to those points. So we have to probably add some kind of priority scheme in this case, if it's the same. And um, I would say in this case, we have go, go for the first occurred is the one that is uh, um, assigned, but that's quite kind of a cheap algorithm. But anyway, we can look at the distances. Uh, now we look at the distance list. We see here we have distances going through. And uh, from that, we want to select which one is the next track. And uh, from that, we can also look at the distances as a little movie here and uh, see how, how they evolve for each pixel. And then the next step is to then decide which one is the right one. So looking at the nearest point found, all pixels are nicely moving up to the upper left corner. And uh, that would be our next, tra next track. And uh, then we do it to tracking in all the frames. And what it looks like is then stepwise going up and up and up and just looking at the nearest neighbor. And um, the initial one is usually the most tricky one. And in particular, if you have more complex cases, it's not so easy to know the first one. And um, because that gives you more or less the direction for the following um, tracking uh, task. So what we can also work with is uh, something called key points. And uh, those are points that are identified in the images. And they should be as unique as possible. And with the help of these key points, we can more easily find the position we want to follow. And um, here you can look at um, an example where we have um, this uh, chessboard. I think it's, uh, it's skewed, yes. It's difficult to see from this perspective. Um, so it's prepared to be a bit skewed. And uh, by using these so-called Harris corner points, that's more or less a set of um, uh, filters that sum up into these uh, key points or corners uh, that we want to look at. And then we can use the corners instead to for the tracking. And um, then we use these corner information and uh, we find we can overlay them on, on the image. And these can then be used as one way of um, tracking where we have the shape changes. And uh, these cor uh, corner points can also... Wait, was this an animation or not? Change is coming, okay. Um, with the cell image, you can do a similar thing. And you see that there are a lot of um, things that are ident identified as corners. So it's more or less that when you apply these uh, Harris filters, you probably have a um, threshold somewhere that we decide, OK, this is b ab above the, uh, the level. And, um, then we take those corners that are identified. And it looks like we have some corners around these um, black areas sometimes on the top of something, depending on, um, on the amplitude of, the, of this uh, Harris output. And, um, but corners as such, they are not so unique. So we may want to have something more um, detailed. But first, let's look at um, how we can do the tracking with these. And uh, here we have an example of um, the chessboard again, which is now moving around. And you can see that the green points, they are following quite nicely. And um, 
that makes it also possible to track how the change is, uh, shape is changing within um, within the object. So it's even rotation and shear independent, which is good. And um, then we can use something more advanced. That's a feature description. In principle, what it does, it is taking the center pixel and looking around, I think, um, um, radius of two pixels, looking around and seeing what kind of pixels does it have around it. And with that, you have a very unique uh, pixel configuration, which can be used for, for the tracking if you want that. And um, more details are given uh, on these links. So it's, um, and th these are based on a similar concept, but with a little bit different ways of describing how the neighborhood is, what it's looking like. And uh, here looking at the cell image again, the bone from the bone, we have some key points and they give you some descriptors and this, this pattern here is no, not a QR code, but each line is like a binary pattern if uh, the pixels around um, this point are uh, below or above a certain threshold. And that gives us the sufficient information for doing the tracking. And well, that wasn't meant to show, I think, but uh, let's see, can I, no. Yeah, so this is, ah, that's just a support function. We don't need to look at it that much. But anyway, in um, this example, I have done a shift in um, Y and X of the cell image. So you can see that, um, for example, this one is closer to the wall and a little bit up. So that is what uh, is happening between these images. And uh, we also added some blurring. Could also be that thanks to uh, motion unsharpness, you get more blurred images between the original and um, the ones in the frame set. And uh, with the help of the so-called brief um, descriptor, we could find some matches. Um, like these two, but the brief is not so good at finding all these, in particular in um, more complicated images. It finds it nicely on if you have houses and uh, nice corners, but uh, maybe if you have a natural image of some sample, it's not so good. So there are also another alternative, which is called the orb ex uh, descriptor. And that one is much better at finding uh, matching pairs between the two. And you can see every uh, short, uh, very dark line is a good match and the uh, uh, grayish is not an ideal match, so it's downtoned. But you can see the general movement is clearly in this uh, diagonal of what I moved. And um, from that, we go on to computing average flow and I think Actually, let's make an early break and um, continue with that after the break.